good afternoon everyone and welcome back now it is time for our second panel discussion on fundraising challenges faced by the founders for this panel i would like to welcome the founder and ceo of guru q ms minal anand the author and angel investor and x500 startup ms shalini prakash the founder at adda 247 mr anil nagar and finally our moderator for the panel professor sme at iit jodhpur mr ditesh mohanot i request all the panelists to kindly introduce themselves maybe a quick you know in a round of introduction ms minal would you like to begin sure um my name is minal anan i'm the founder and ceo of guru q guru q is an edtech company that um connect students with the right tutors we're an aggregator and a facilitator of learning we provide online tuitions as well as home tuitions we have over 35000 tutors now on our platform from across the country um you know so we're looking forward to building this company even further and of course um, looking forward to speaking at this event with all these esteemed panelists thanks minal for the introduction uh, so next i could i go to uh, Shalini, uh, and then I'll go to Anil, and then introduce myself. So, Shalini, would you please introduce yourself? Thank you. Yeah, uh, yeah. I am Shalini. I um, I mostly been working actively in the venture capital and the startup ecosystem. I work with several uh, startup accelerators as well as funds. Um, I most recently worked with five hundred startups, so valley based fund in, in um, investing in early stage um, uh, founders here in India. and uh, i do have an entre- some entrepreneurial experience because i try to do my own startup in rewards and loyalty ecosystem and um, right now again um, i am i'm i have my own micro fund called purple matter where i'm doing active uh, investing and working with early stage entrepreneurs i recently uh, published a book called clueless at 30 uh, which is really focused on the millennial anxiety and um, alternate career options and so on so focus mostly on that yeah so that's a little bit about me Yeah, thanks, Shalini, for the introduction. Uh, Anil, uh, please, uh, if you could introduce yourself. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Anil Nagar. I am founder and CEO of Adda Twenty Four Seven. Adda Twenty Four Seven is a uh, is a test prep platform where we provide online courses for various exams in India. Uh, so we cater to all kind of exams, starting from IIT, NEET to uh, UPSC, government test prep, GATE, almost all kind of uh, test prep exams in India. Uh, primarily we cater to tier 2 tier 3 audience and uh, in a way uh, uh, we uh, we want to build it for bharat uh, the people who are still in uh, smaller places and struggling to get basic education and uh, yeah so uh, in terms of uh, reach we are already reaching almost uh, 1.5 to 2 crore people every month on our uh, these these people are coming to our platform to get various kind of uh, courses and uh, uh, various kind of uh, educational programs on our website okay yeah thanks anil so uh, i can relate because i once prepared for civil services and had to you uh, rent out a room uh, in uh, rajendranagar and uh, uh, have to pay fees to the civil, uh, huge fees to the coaching centers and you know how that whole ecosystem works so i think uh, as an edtech company uh, trying to create a platform around that for uh, so that access could be provided to the to the have nots of uh, coaching and tutorials and coaching tutorials i think it's a great work so right so what we'll do is uh, okay let me introduce myself so i am uh, basically uh, a researcher in entrepreneurship i uh, did my phd from indian institute of management trichy and uh, for my research we were looking at uh, frameworks and tools for business communities uh, who have not gone to b schools and yet are strategizing and are successful for centuries so my methodology was ethnography or anthropological method of inquiry so i went to an industrial town in rajasthan lived there for a year with my family rented out a house in a business in a community of businessmen and worked as a munim in a 80 year old firm uh, and uh, so munim basically in their parlance is a supervisor or accountant so that was the methodology i used to understand uh, the nuanced aspects of entrepreneurship in their world uh, 
then after my phd i joined opajindan gobind university as there for a couple of years and two months back i have joined indian institute of technology jodhpur the school of management uh, within iit uh, as a professor of strategy and entrepreneurship so uh, that's my intro and uh, as we, as you all know the topic that we delve into is around fund raising raising and the trigger points that was shared with us i'll just uh, brief them uh, for the audience so first we look at the common issues in the fund raising process and the challenges uh, that founders face and how to address them that's the second trigger point a uh, third point is uh, the clauses that one needs to be cautious of uh, while one goes for uh, multiple rounds of funding uh third a fourth point is uh, what could be the ideal pitch and uh issues around storytelling right so that is a fourth point and uh, the fifth trigger point is the due dil- diligence that both the investor as well as uh, uh, a founder or a, uh, the person the entrepreneur has to really go through so these are the main points that we go into uh how we are uh, placed today is that we go one by one initially so every speaker has 10 minutes professor satya from edi will be joining us in 15 20 minutes so i'll introduce him after he joins so first uh, uh, every speaker speaks for around 10 minutes 8 to 10 minutes and then we'll collectively have a discussion for another 10 minutes after everybody has spoken and finally we open it up for the audience and we can get into the q and a so that's how we are placed so uh, uh, the line of speakers uh, the flow will be uh, that we decided was that uh shalini will go first uh, followed by anil and then meenal uh and then professor satya will join us so he will be the last one to speak on the topic so he's also a finance prof so we'll have him also and his inputs so over to you shalini yeah so uh you know i worked uh, for uh, several years in uh, early stage investing and one of the uh uh challenges uh, that found you know founders face is not not having a clear understanding of what do they actually want out of their investor itself right i mean how do you choose your investor do you uh, do you need to uh, do they need to have just industry familiarity do you already do you need someone who's a hands on investor or a hands off investor and so on so i feel like a lot of early stage entrepreneurs don't do enough uh, research uh in terms of uh, you know what is it that they're looking for i mean sure you know early stage you just need the capital to go build your mvp uh to start testing your hypothesis and so on but what's also very uh important that one needs to understand is you know getting an investor on board is like getting a partner on board for life right i mean you can't just divorce your investor if things go uh, down south so one is your energy is matching or your vision for the company vision for the product matching um is important but on the other side you know what is it that you actually need from them you know are you looking for connections are you looking for someone who understands the space completely and so on so so it's important to have clarity from day one what is it that you want uh, from your uh, investor and i think a lot of early stage uh, founders really really miss that so i think uh, seeking that synergy very early on is very important yeah so uh, uh, moving beyond uh, synergy so uh, there is also one of the trigger points is uh, uh, the clauses that one should be cautious of so anything on that shalini uh, because you have experience of early stage investing so Uh, from both the yeah. perspective one is from the entrepreneur perspective the other is from of obviously the investor's perspective the investor anyways yeah. do his due diligence but then what about the founder yeah or the entrepreneur yeah i mean yeah so i think uh, definitely when you have um, uh, you know also when you're a little well versed with how the ecosystem works in terms of term sheets and so on right it's very important that you also get a, a term sheet which is uh, friendly to uh, both parties right i mean right from day one uh, if you're thinking about um, um you know if you've not protected your rights enough as an entrepreneur uh there's always uh you know a difficult time for the um entrepreneur going forward like for example things like um three things that founders should really up- avoid uh, to retain more upside for themselves and for the employees is say for example liquidation multiplier right i mean it's it's a standard that it remains at 1x 
or say that, you know, anti-dilution provisions or even participating in preferred stock and so on, right? I mean, these are things that founders need to sort of really um, acquaint themselves with these terminologies and how these term sheets work and so on so that they protect their own interests as well as their employees. Uh, we've seen a lot of cases where um, as a fund, uh, you know, when you co-invest with early, uh, with different um, uh, funds themselves, it's very important that you're protecting uh, your, the founders or entrepreneurs that you're investing in as well, right? Because only if the entrepreneur becomes successful, I become successful. So a lot of times when we've co-invested with other funds, we, you know, definitely push back and, you know, ask them to make it more founder friendly. So, yeah, I think uh, it's important that every entrepreneur understands, you know, liquidation and preferred stocks and anti-dilution. Some of these classes, how they really work. And so they've, they've keep themselves protected from day one. And uh, uh, so uh, coming to uh, uh, these issues, so uh, what about uh, like in the journey, let's say you have uh, two, three investors, right? And uh, each holding a block. And obviously I'm assuming here that the founder has the biggest block, but then uh, what about the exit? So how do you, uh, what is the politics around the exit, you know, if, uh, from an investor standpoint? So I think each fund has uh, his or her own, uh, their own strategy, right? I mean, first of all, it depends. Are you an angel investor? Then your the way you look at the company and exit itself is very different from a fund, right? Because a fund is more like an institutional um, investing uh, entity. So their motivation is very uh, different in terms of the returns that they generate for their LPs and so on. So, so I would say the dynamics is different based on the thesis of the fund and there is no one way to look at it. And also I think what matters really is um, exits are also largely based upon the strong conviction I have for a certain uh, industry, right? I mean, I might feel very strongly about, say, D to C companies in terms of, you know, the rising, rising middle class today and affordability and so on. So I might feel very strongly about it today. And say three, or, uh, three four years down the line, if I don't think that uh, D2C companies are actually making that kind of revenues and the growth story is not as big as it was initially perceived to be. And say, if I get an opportunity to uh, take an exit, I would take an exit because I don't have strong conviction in that space anymore so that's one type of example so it depends on what is my key takeaway uh, from there right i mean sometimes say if i've been seven years and i've been riding in this company and i don't see this uh, becoming much bigger than already it is then then i take take the money out and uh, so on and sometimes if you have to rotate money within the fund itself right so i mean it depends where you are the dynamics are um you know always that it's mostly tougher for entrepreneurs because there is um more riding on them to make this uh, successful. There's always pressure also on the entrepreneurs. A lot of funds uh, and investors have the pressure on them, uh, especially when they seek an exit and they've sort of been riding that journey for really, really long. So there is no one uh, right answer, uh, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for uh, Shalini for delving into this. So uh, now we go to uh, Anil. Uh, uh, to and I open it for you. Uh, feel free to uh, talk about any of the trigger points uh, that we have uh, laid down. So over to you, Anil. Sure. Well, I will start with the initial point itself, where we said that uh, how to choose the right investor for yourself. I think, uh, in my opinion, it depends on the stage of the company. Uh, in which case, you you would like to have different kind of investor on your cap table. Of course, uh, in the investor community also there is there is that kind of broad division. But uh, when you want to think from business perspective, you would like to uh, get the best partners. So I always think of this as as uh, you are bringing somebody as a partner uh, with you, uh, not just money, but a lot of other things around that. So, for example, when when we were very in, in the very initial stage in 2016, 17, uh, and we were kind of experimenting around the product. So, one of the key thing for us was uh, freedom in terms of what exactly we want to do. Or, let's say we are experimenting uh, wherein we might fail. Also, uh, let's say we'll do uh, ten experiments, and out of that, most we are going to fail uh, probably. So. Uh, so they, they want you want someone who uh, who uh, will be supportive uh, at that stage in terms of your experimentation, your tweaking, your uh, uh, even in terms of uh, guiding you on the broader technology aspects. Uh, 
uh, when you are uh, thinking of product. Uh, so one of the key thing uh, across all the stages, which which I prefer for myself, is uh, around freedom uh, in terms of executing things, in terms of taking decisions. Of course, uh, in many cases, what I have seen is that investors are also uh, uh, they also have a view on your segment or your business and your play, and they want to contribute and uh, want to participate uh, with you in terms of thought process, strategy, and all, which which is fine, which is fine to to a large extent because as I said that it's it's kind of partnership. Money is one of the aspect, but otherwise, uh, uh, it takes a lot to build a great business, and uh, there uh, this partnership really helps. Uh, for example, in in uh, in our Series A funding, when we were looking for uh, uh, somebody who uh, Series A was some somewhere where uh, we we could have figured we have figured out that this is what we want to do, but uh, we were kind of uh, thinking of growth. That now we are uh, from here, we want to take a journey which it takes us two uh, x, three x, five x in coming one to two years, and there uh, uh, so. Uh, in our journey, when we started in 2016, this was mostly around the government aspect. So we used to provide online courses for government jobs. And uh, 2016, we raised our seed funding, which was first funding, uh, which, which is which was mostly from that aspect, which I just now uh, talked about, that we, we thought that we need freedom. Somebody who can give us money, we want to experiment, we want to think of various models and all. But 2019, when we were actually raising our first round, which was Series A round, we were thinking of someone who can actually add value other than money, uh, who can uh, give us uh, uh, add value in terms of technology also, in terms of business also. And uh, that's when we uh, raised funding from InfoAs, which was more around, uh, because InfoAs has, has a uh, background in terms of catering to unemployed youth. So they run one of the popular website, nofi.com, and they had a lot of data and a lot of insights around it. And since our business was around uh, government job test prep, uh, broadly around jobs, so that was a perfect fit for us. Although it's just a financial investment, but uh, it, it adds value uh, in terms of giving us insights, trends, and what works, what does not work, a lot of other things. And uh, uh, after that, when we were raising Series B, which was led by US Base, thought was totally different because uh, by then we uh, we had moved out of jobs and we were catering to many other segments, including gate and uh, IDG, medical, UPSC and all. So it was around who, uh, who can be one partner uh, who is more, uh, uh, who has more deeper pockets in terms of supporting us in a longer term. For example, let's say we raise Series B, but uh, it's a long journey from there also. Uh, and we will need partners who can probably uh, support us in next funding rounds and who can uh, uh, who can also give us uh, uh, broader uh, uh, guidelines or who can partner with us in, in terms of brainstorming uh, taking company from here to let's say IPO stage uh, probably that's the aspiration and you would like to have those kind of investors who have been through that who have been uh, partnered with company from that stage to IPO stage so I, I think it's, uh, it depends, it all depends on the stage of the company and uh, your personal aspirations also. Because what what uh, uh, other side maybe a lot of companies are built uh, more from the perspective uh, that ultimately they will be acquired by some other companies. And they, they are trying to solve such a small problem which in itself cannot become a business, big business, but uh, the one of the good outcome can be that one big, uh, uh, tech company will acquire those. So you have to think of all those things uh, when when you are uh, uh, trying to find a uh, uh, good partner or good investor for yourself. And of course, as uh, I think Shalini was mentioning that uh, uh, when it comes to documentation, it's very tricky. And I will, I will advise all the founders to uh, to be thorough with those uh, terms, uh, terms which, which we generally uh, talk about in term sheets and even definitives. This is very tricky because uh, in uh, in our personal experience also and in some other uh, uh, some other founders also what I've seen is that uh, initially in initial stages uh, founders do not uh, look too much into such things and they kind of ignore and uh, later on when you are going for next fundraise 
then uh, there may be few things in your term sheet or in your definitives which might create trouble in terms of raising your next round so you have to think of longer term that okay now you are raising today you are raising a fund and uh, you will have certain thoughts in your mind for example with this uh, fundraise you will move from x to y but is y the end of the game or you want to move to z also if you want to move to z also then probably you will be raising more funds in future and uh, in that perspective your current definitive or your agreement with current investor has to be right uh, rightly structured so that it is very conductive for the next investor to join on board and uh, it is uh, next investor is comfortable with those terms also so i have seen a lot of fights around that in uh, multiple companies uh, because initially founders are not very used to all these terms and they they uh, want to think of short term here as i said that's it what matters but uh, in longer term these these things create problem okay yeah so uh, yeah thanks anil for you know giving us a very uh, practical insight uh, and uh, bringing our own experience to the table uh, yeah so in a in a month if uh, if one becomes uh, short sighted then there is a problem or sometimes the entrepreneur doesn't want to be short sighted but in the heat of things in the urge to get the funds uh, if you dilute too much early then what about the next series of rounds right so uh, those issues are uh, 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 very crucial and uh, there is no one way as shalini also mentioned uh, but one needs to be uh, uh, i would say uh, i won't use the word visionary or stop short of using the word visionary but uh, what you said you know uh, just a to b is not the only journey there is a c and there is a d so uh, uh, that is something that uh, entrepreneurs uh, needs to be very uh, uh, aware of uh, and then i think once what shali said that once you are aware that what do you what do you want out of your investor are you just looking for funds which is rarely the case uh, or you're looking for a value add hands on ap uh, approach or connections or he connects you to or he brings technology uh, in, as anil also mentioned so uh, i think once you know that then you also then you can just you know uh, go back and see how much you want to dilute uh, and how much this investor is willing to take which is just not money but other aspects okay so we go to uh, meenal uh so uh, minal over to you and uh, yeah so you have already sent a very structured uh, uh, format so over to you yeah thank you thank you jitesh um i think just to touch upon a little bit on what shalini and anil have already said um mm -hmm. you know how to choose the right investor for your startup um i think it really depends on what stage your startup is at what stage your company is at you know if you're at an early stage funding or seed round funding um i think it's important to find investors that align with your strategic vision and the values of your company you know you have to see whether he or she is the right fit for your company in terms of the brand in terms of the culture in terms of the vision where you want your company to be and where you want to take your company so i think that alignment of vision is uh, something that is very important um also things like you know ability to fund not only current but maybe in future rounds or maybe if you have future requirements of funding you know how uh, willing or how able are they to actually support you in those endeavors um also things like reputation of the investor or the or the fund is important it might help a lot when you go out for your second or third round of funding um it also adds a lot of credibility to your business and to your company so i think that is also something that startups and entrepreneurs should keep in mind um how well uh, you know they how well connected are your investors can they help you raise more funds in the future can they help appeal to other investors to come in are they going to uh, you know be a lead a lead lead investor are they not um, these are things and questions that one should consider you know when trying to choose the right investor um something that is very important that i always stress stress upon is you know the how well the founder and the investor gets along because i think that is something that is very important uh, developing that uh, connection developing that rapport right from the beginning i think is important so that you both can work together to build the company and take the vision forward um also something that i would recommend that founders uh, you know keep in mind is that control in intent you know what intention do the investors really have with your business are they going to want to control your business are they just going to want to be strategic partners are they going to just be putting in the capital so all of that i feel needs to be clearly defined as well 
at the beginning um you know the more uh, you define your association the more um you know everything is laid out properly i think the less ambiguity there will be and the less uh issues you will face going down the road so i think these are the few points that i wanted to touch upon which i think shalini and anil have already done so as well um going forward i think there are various challenges that uh, you know founders face while raising funds um a lot of founders you know before they even go out to investors sometimes uh, don't really have a clear vision or a business plan or sometimes may have difficulty in communicating that vision and business plan to the investors so i think the first thing that you know all founders should do is ensure that they have their clear business plan vision everything completely set forth uh, for them and then be able to communicate that vision very uh, eloquently or you know very clearly to your investors so that they know exactly what you are trying to build how you are trying to build it where you want to take it and what your intentions are uh secondly uh which i was also which i had said earlier was alignment of thought process and vision it's very important to be aligned with your potential investors in terms of where you want to take the company you know that kind of clarity really helps with uh growth and expand quick growth and expansion i would say you know so that all the other stuff is taken care of and both of you can just focus on building the business um then also another issue that founders often face uh is you know the inability to accurately assess their fund requirements um you know how what funds will be required where they'll be utilizing those funds uh you know how much working capital might be required what is the cyclicality of the business so various features that need to be really thought through uh, assessed properly before going to an investor i think that's also very important um and also um a lot of lot of founders face this issue today you know is that access to right investors yes there are a lot of investors today in the ecosystem and there are lots of funds and there are lots of uh, avenues that one can explore but access to the right investors is also very important because like i said strategic investors right investors that are going to work for you an investor that work, might work for one industry there's no guarantee that that particular in investor is going to work in another industry um also a lot of people find it difficult um to actually even if they have met investors or whatever getting being able to get a foot through the door you know and trying to actually develop that rapport you might network you might meet a person once but you know really trying to build that relationship up so that uh, you can work towards a uh, you know a more investor founder relationship also a lot of founders today uh, even though there are so many incubators and accelerators available today that people can join there's specific ones for women uh, there's specific ones for various industries i think various uh, founders today especially millennials they are, don't really find um, it easy to get access to various incubators and accelerators or one that want to take them on um you know and then the documentation part i think anil and shalini have already covered so i don't really want to step on that because i think they've done a fabulous job in covering that um and of course because you know march is women's day i do have to say that women founders also uh you know face quite a lot of issues uh some stem from unconscious or conscious gen conscious gender biases you know sometimes they're not taken as seriously as their men counterparts uh you know sometimes it's harder for them to even get through the door at networking events various things like that so i think hopefully that is something that can uh that we all can work towards by empowering them and making sure that you know they have access to all uh, the accelerators and incubators and funds and investors the same way as you know their male counterparts would okay yeah so uh, i think uh uh so i i work on subaltern studies so uh, certainly gender uh, continues to be uh, an issue uh, how much we can claim that you know we have come a long way but i think uh, in uh, in quite corners there is still uh, discrimination uh, especially when it comes to fund raising i don't know this is a problem india specific or global uh, but uh, what you see is that you know investors tend to assume that if uh, the founder is a is a woman uh isko finance kya right and uh, which is not the case right so uh, uh yeah so i think a uh, uh, lot needs to be done uh, uh to be and i think uh, it can only happen through successful cases coming up uh, where uh, you know investors uh, get a taste of uh, uh and uh, also their 
preconceived notions uh, gets thrown out of the window uh, that uh, specifically in the area of uh, when i when it comes to finance so we have seen that uh, that there is an assumption that uh, uh, you know they are not at par right and that is something that uh, uh, exactly think, even though our finance minister is a woman yeah yeah so yeah so yeah so that is one uh, even then we see this happening so which is uh, even more worrying another thing that i uh, uh, could pick up was uh, this tuning between the founder and the investor and uh, i think uh, that is uh, very crucial but my sense is that uh, if there is a, if somebody has invested we assume that the tuning is uh, that would have happened uh, but then you can't foresee everything and then later you see that while we were yelling out well uh, uh because you know uh, professor saras saraswati who works on uh, this uh, idea of effectuation in entrepreneurship so she says that you know uh, a firm is an artifact you cannot predict everything in advance right you are co creating your market is also evolving your segments are evolving uh, so when you started you thought something as what you wanted to create and then slowly and slowly as signals comes from the market as you get your feedbacks uh, you keep iterating uh, your model right and in that iteration uh, people assume most theories on iteration assume that it's the owner doing it uh, forgetting that there is a market that is also co evolving and there are investors with certain fixed expe expectations and that is where i think uh, many times iterations and investors expectations are at loggerheads and that's where you see problems uh, coming in uh, so it is at that time that the founder has to put his foot down and say no uh, this has been thought through whatever we are uh, iterating and changing so that is again uh, something to be uh, looked at so professor satya i think has not joined so far so i would open it for the questions if there are any questions or uh, uh, and if there are no questions then we can of course uh, uh, discuss other issues yeah okay so if by the time any question comes in you know i was curious to know from anil you know uh, so anil uh, how you have been able to create the mukherjee nagar and the rajendra nagar online so that is what you do right so uh, what i mean is that there is an ecosystem that operates just not it's just not the coaching center and the and the and the, and the students right uh, there is also a lot of uh, uh, lot of practices between students so like sharing the load uh, teaching each other uh, you know uh, uh, group work and all uh, so now in a virtual world uh, in a test prep kind of an platform uh, how do you are you thinking on those lines how do you create that so it came to my mind like uh, because most more often you know what we have seen is in most of the ed tech startups and uh, at tech platforms what you see is that there is a more focus on the relationship between students and the tutors or students and the faculty depends on the of course the platform right so uh, uh, in case of guruku it could be tutor tutor and the student in case of upgrad it could be you know the faculty uh, in a in a university and uh, uh, the students but what about the interaction between students right so how is there anything uh, minal can also come in uh, shalini and anil Yeah, so Jitesh, uh, in our case, uh, most of the things we, which you were just talking about, uh, these have been the key. Uh, so I'll tell you how we started and uh, what has been our approach uh, while building uh, test prep online. Uh, our own background is that we come from villages. Uh, so I come from a village in UP, and uh, why we started this was again about because of that because. we we saw that gap in our own upbringing that in village there is nothing in cities there are a lot of things and somehow we wanted to uh, create that level playing field and uh, uh, the way we started was uh, we uh, started with kind of free platforms where we started giving a lot of uh, information to uh, to aspirants to students so that first of all they are aware that what are the opportunities because one of the thing what we realized while uh, while we look at villages and towns or our own background is that people are not aware at all what are the opportunities what they can get or uh, at their uh, let's say on their education level or their uh, uh, 
smartness uh, or whatever talent they have uh, what they can get out of it for example when it comes to various jobs in uh, uh, government so there are jobs from clerical to banking jobs to defense to upsc to state pc all kind of jobs are there and uh, uh, if we want to map that with the background of people who come from smaller places so most of these guys have these aspirations and will uh, fit properly into uh, these jobs so this is the first thing we did and uh, just just spreading the information and uh, taking that uh, uh, information to uh, everyone so we we kind of uh, we had multiple portals we still have multiple portals uh, multiple webs where we are providing a specific uh, domain specific information for example we launched one of the website by the name bankasetta.com and we said that okay if you want to think of banking and you want to make your career in banking then everything is there and somehow uh, that that's the first trigger for anybody that the people are able to see uh, see uh, see the future that okay this is something i can achieve uh, and uh, with that the next step was to engage those users on a platform and doing all those things which you were just telling that when uh, uh, when students want to they are, when they are preparing then a lot of things happen they want to study together they want to talk they want to share notes they they have doubts they want to clear those doubts so we created that ecosystem which was again a free ecosystem and then at the top of it we built uh, the layer where we started providing our paid courses which include live uh, classroom program or on demand video courses or ebook or anything which uh, which can add value at the top of it and uh, if you look at our funnel also so uh, every month almost uh, uh, 15 to 20 million uh, roughly 1.5 to 2 crore users come on our platform and if you map that to number of paid users that is still very less so we will have around uh, 70 80000 paid users uh every month in indian context uh, looking at other tech other attacks i think this will be a big number but if you look at from our own users who are on their platform it's a, it's a very small number less than 1% so uh, so this has been the approach and uh, my belief is that technology can actually revolutionize education it is already doing but uh, my belief is that this has just started because in offline ecosystem you have a lot of limitations you can do only those things but in online it opens up so many doors for you which starts from the recommendation to best providing the best teacher to you to students to uh, artificial intelligence machine learning online 24 into 7 doubts so many things which are not possible in uh, offline and again two things which we want to focus going forward we have been focusing but those two th- things have been at the core of the company are around making education affordable because this is one of the challenge we have some attacks but the kind of money they charge from students is practically not affordable for our uh, masses to buy those courses and uh, uh, get benefit of those courses so one is uh, making them affordable and our courses are as cheap as 1000 to 5000 rupees this and this is just cheap and second core has been around uh, vernacular content because what you realize is that when you want to think of tier 2 tier 3 or uh, you want to think of villages these guys uh, they cannot talk in english right and not everybody can talk in hindi also although hindi we can also consider as one of the vernacular language but if you go to south north east then these guys talk in their own parlance so vernacular content or teaching in vernacular languages has been again one of the second focus area for us yeah so, so, so anil, uh, yeah so anil we have few questions um, meena and shalini so uh, i'll uh, go one by one so let me start with the question raised by darshana and she says that is there any uh, standard legal format uh, between founder and investor so uh, yeah let's so uh, anybody wants to uh, get into the, uh, or answer this yeah. in the, i mean other than the standard uh, documents like safe document right i think there is um, there also used to be something called kiss document that there's safe which is very popular right now those are the standard documents which are used as early stage um, for early stage uh, invest investments so those are uh, which sort of cover for both parties yeah the next question is uh, uh, from umar and he is asking that uh, 
it is uh, is it advisable to consult a lawyer uh, for early stage uh, fundraising so uh, obviously yes because uh, it depends on how much knowledge as a founder has but then even even if you are well versed with the, the most of the things i think uh, mean all if you want to uh, i mean i think it's definitely important to always consult a lawyer before you sign any contracts or any legal documents and definitely things like term sheets and all and when you are doing fundraising and all i think definitely having a lawyer who can go through everything verify everything go through all the clauses uh you know and give you the go ahead more eyes are better then you know one for sure because you might miss something and a lawyer is going to see it from a different standpoint than a founder will see it right that's the whole point like i don't think anyone should sign any document without having them checked because you never know what's in the fine print yeah okay uh, uh one more question from ocean uh so ocean narang is asking uh, uh, about this process from fundraising uh, which is uh, the first level of discussion uh uh so from that discussion to finally signing it so what is the uh, 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 if you could just in short tell us uh, about the process anyone uh, so the journey of fundraising from the let's say uh, for let's say we take early stage in rk so uh, from first discussion to the final signing what is uh, well there is no theory around steps but then if you could just tell us your experience here yeah. yeah i think it's a 3 2 6 month kind of process a long answer <laughs> <laughs> no one's answering. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sure, sorry. Process. I'll I'll briefly I can I can briefly give an answer to that but I think other uh, panelists can also join in. But I think this is 3 to 1 uh, 3 to 6 month kind of process. So initially you will start talking uh, with investors so maybe you will shortlist a list of 5 to 6 investors where you will pitch in your idea and uh, Uh, uh post that what i have seen is immediately if somebody that depends on the stage but let's say early stage if somebody likes your idea then they will uh, give you a term sheet post term sheet there is some kind of due diligence uh depends on again stage of the company uh, very early stage there will be hardly anything but generally it is there and then uh, definitive documents are uh, created which give give it a proper legal structure to your partnership with investors and post that the money comes in the bank So this, I think this is the first. The first. <laughs> Anil, Anil has given a very rosy picture of how <laughs> how seamless this is. I'm <laughs> just going to say that. But yeah, it sounds so nice. Yeah. 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 So Anil, 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 so Anil, could have, Anil, you could you could have decorated. The gory details, <laughs> details are you need to pick two hundred people, and then maybe you'll talk to ten, and then maybe two will invest. <laughs> I think you need to have a lot of patience and a lot of uh, support, and I think you need to meditate and do a lot of mental check exercises and stuff when you're fundraising because it it can take a huge toll on you as an entrepreneur and you know the stress yeah. and all that. Yeah, and I think uh, also planning, uh, uh, knowing about the time period is important because uh, if you're burning cash, then you know how long can you wait? So yeah. uh, start early, you know, that's it. Yeah, because. There is a six months lead time. I don't know if it, if it, if it is six or even more. So, yeah. Uh, I think someone's asked a question about what components should be included in an ideal pitch. So I can just go over this very quickly. Yeah. Um, I think it's very important to create a story around your pitch. Uh, you know, give the entire picture. Start off with what problem, need, and pain points you're really trying to solve. Um, what are the USPs? of your company and of your brand what i usually recommend is make a list of at least 50 to 60 usps you know that your company um is catering to and that is planning to solve and what are the uh, you know what your company really adds value to versus what is not there in the market already um of course understanding uh and putting across the solution that you're trying to provide in the best possible manner why you founded the company who the founding team is and what the founding team really brings as their value add um you know what is your background as a founder and why are you the best person to run the business also i think it's important to then mention you know your if you achieved anything like your mvp or mention your metrics traction gmv unit economics all of that 
your go to market strategy of course is something that the investors will be very very interested to listen to um and of course you know depends on the stage of uh, you know your business is at utilization of funds that you have done till now versus utilization of the investor funds so i think all of those things are important and you know the other panelists can of course add to this list yeah meenal uh, sorry shalini or anil yeah i think uh, um, at least at least for me uh, uh, what's important is that when you're actually building a uh, startup very very early on right at least for me two things are very important uh, one is what is the unique insight that you have right i mean uh, you know with what conviction are you building or you must be having a strong hypothesis on why this is going to work now or why does the world need this right now uh and how your product is really um uh, fixing that gap and so on right so having that strong conviction and insight is very very important and the second thing which also seems like common sense uh is you know your thorough understanding of your customer right uh which a lot of us miss out uh you know if you ask them who's your first customer a lot of people don't even know who their first customer is it's never everyone if, even though you might actually narrow it down to an age group and saying okay it's women 18 to 25 actually it is much more than that right you need to be you know eat breathe sleep your customer you need to understand you know things like you know what is their average spend how much do they spend their time on their phones or how much um you know what's their our day looking like and their user uh, journey lifestyle it's so important to understand your customer very well i respect of it being a b2b or b2c you know in terms of the pain points and uh, uh, their everyday life right you need to have a thorough understanding of that and which i think a lot of uh, entrepreneurs miss in um, early stage because that's that's these are the only small things that will help you get started uh, you know like you know when you have to catapult to the next stage uh, very quickly so so i would say these are the two things having a strong conviction around the space that you're building why you're building what you're building and what's the unique insight that you have that you're starting with and the second one being thorough understanding of your uh, first customer yeah. okay so uh, if there are any more questions uh, otherwise we can uh, you know wrap it up so yeah so uh, thanks uh, everyone uh, minal uh, anil shalini uh, professor satya could not join us so uh, yeah so uh, uh, fund raising is uh, the most uh, i won't say, it it could not be called the most critical but uh, it's something that decides how you scale up right so uh, you may have a great idea and you have you've seen the idea working uh, uh, but then uh, you are you, you are creating something to scale up finally right so the all the notions of unicorn decacorn do not will not happen if you do not scale up right and and uh, i think and product market fit does not happen overnight it's also an emergent process right? but then you need funds uh, at every step at every day every hour uh, especially if you are doing cash burn uh, uh, so uh, then uh, uh this is critical right and uh, and as i also mentioned earlier the trajectories will change and uh, given that uh, uh, as your business model you will not know what will work on day 1 or day 5 right it will keep emerging and keep uh, changing and then is is the investor are the investors on in line with that and are they flexible enough uh, is also equally important so uh, uh while investors have a right to be due diligent uh, it's also the founders who have to be even more uh, diligent right with this uh, thanks everyone and over to you karan yeah thank you so much jesh and uh, thank you so much to each of the panelists for uh, having us and uh, in fact uh, i would like to also mention that all these uh, panel discussions you know give us a new perspective and insights and that's what ixi summit is all about bringing new uh, insights uh, you know to the stakeholders of the startup ecosystem so on that note uh, thank you so much minal for sharing your insight thank you so thank much shalini and uh, thank you so much anuji and thank you so much desh for uh, moderating it so nicely